presentation. Um, oh, I know what I wanted to say. I wanted to say thank you so much to Nyla Small, who helped Susie with her technology. And also thanks to anybody uh, who was kind enough to bring treats tonight. We really appreciate that. And I'll say this once now, but I'll try and remember it at the end. When you're leaving, we're going to have little bowls out there. Please take some of those leftover treats if they're leftovers. Because I, you know, it's just better that way. Okay, Susie, you can take it away. Okay, don't take it away quite yet. I guess it's in the way now. <laughs> that would help. Short program, it's over. <laughs> oh, extra. This is the early view of Bailey's Harbor. It was taken, we, I don't know the year, but it was just to give you an idea what Bailey's Harbor was like way back, because the story of the cemetery is going to start way back. Okay, uh, my name is Susie ba Pyle Baldry, and I'm here to talk about the history of the town of Bailey's Harbor. It's loci located in a highway double E about a half, about a mile from here, and it's on the corner of E and F. And by the way, the trees that you're going to go by as you go out there were planted by my great-great-grandfather, Carl Pyle. The Piles owned that whole corner. They owned it on both sides, F and double E where they built their farm after immigrating here from Germany. And the original farm was on Highway F, but it's gone. But across the street stands the White House that Bobby Schultz, one of our town board members, still lives in. I am the daughter of a grave digger. It seems cemeteries run in our family. My great-grandfather, uh, Carl Pyle, was a town sexton in 1894. And in the 1920s, my grandfather, Otto Pyle, became a sexton. His wife, Hedwig, felt she was a cemetery caregiver. Grandpa Otto would also often say to Grandma, you never have time to take, stay home and take care of our 10 children, but you always have time to deliver other people's babies and tend the cemetery. My dad, Roly Pyle. He started digging graves when he was 13 years old, and he continued until he was 84. My brother, Lauren, helped my dad dig graves. And when I married my husband, Gene, he helped. When Lauren had a son, Kevin, he helped. And when I had a son, Jason, he helped. When my dad retired, he sold his business to his grandson, Kevin Pyle. When I got on the town board in 1990, I took over the job of top cemetery records. It was a job no one wanted but me. And in a small way, I became a grave digger as I would bury cremation remains. And the picture that you see of my dad, Rolly, was taken at the cemetery by his granddaughter, Kristen, daughter of Lauren. And if you look at the stuff there, she did a marvelous article about my dad in April of 1995. Most of the information that you're going to hear tonight has come from my dad. Some of it may be jaded. Some of it may have changed a little bit when a story is told. We all know things change just a bit. He started at 13, and at 15, he had his own business of digging graves. His first job was for his uncle Gus Heinrich from Milwaukee, and he charged him $10. He always said he got started because he lived on the corner of Double E and F and was close by. He dug for eight Northern Door cemeteries, and he did it until 84. In the early days in the winter, he would build a fire on the grave sites to help melt the frost. It wasn't an easy job. 
cold weather, snow, ice, and rain. But even in the later years, when he had a tractor and an air hammer, it always wasn't easy. My son Jason found that out one day when he was home from college and his grandfather asked him to help dig two graves the next day. So Jason said, sure, it was a chance to earn some money. Being a young man and missing his friends, he went out that night and had a really good time. And it was quite obvious the next morning when he got up, he'd had a really good time. But let me tell you, this was January, and there's nothing like a zero degree temperature, wind, frozen ground, and an air hammer to wake you up <laughs> and give you a real good headache. The hardest part of digging a grave for my dad was when it was a family member or a friend. And when you live in a small community, it's most everybody you know. But he always said a child was the hardest. But it was a job he was most proud of, of all the years that he lived. And I can understand that over the years, as I've been a part of doing this, when my mom died, because I was on the town board at the time, when my dad died, my husband died, and my sister died, part of my job as being on that town board was to stake out the graves. I did it, and I was so proud, and it was a job that I felt proud that I could do. Some of the memories, we got to ride in that dump truck when we were kids. Now, I know they wouldn't allow you now. There was no seat belts in those days, and there's none up there. But Dad would let us sit up there and ride in the truck box until we got to the cemetery. We'd run and play till the grave was dug, and then we'd look, because we were sure, we were absolutely sure, there had to be a treasure someplace in the bottom of that grave. Sometimes there were bones. The cemetery, it was old. Gravestones weren't always placed. And sometimes uh, wooden crosses were used, but of course they degraded. We grew up thinking that that was our playground. So now we'll go to the beginning of the story. In the history of Door County by Holland, this was a letter that was written by a Mr. Barry. And he talks about in 1861, Gibraltar split to become Gibraltar, Egg Harbor, and Bailey's Harbor. Bailey's Harbor held their first meeting in 1862. These are three pictures that were taken from the Pyle Farm. And if you look up to the left on that top one, that is the homestead. And at the very top, you're coming from the east going west. And those are the trees that my great-grandfather had planted. The little boy with the wagon was actually the son of my dad's sister, Martha Fleschel. The next one is going to be the town sign. This was put in recently, I think, maybe two or three years ago. And it's a beautiful sign. And it says, Bailey's Harbor Town. 1869. That was the time of not the establishment of the cemetery, but of rather of the town itself. The original lots were eight grave sites. The lot was 20 by 20. It sold for two dollars. Eight grave sites for two dollars. Now a single lot is 125 dollars if you're a property owner, and if you're not, it is a thousand dollars. We found that a lot of people drove by and just loved that little cemetery and they wanted to be buried there. The town does take care of all of it, so it is through our taxes that the maintenance is taken care of. The town also maintains the Catholic cemetery and they pay the town for doing that. Now we'll move on to some maps, or not maps, these are the deeds. These were found after Beverly Starnes and Jerry Bakes Old, uh, Williams did this, and it's a copy of the deeds in succession, how the town became to get the property. And it's quite interesting. There's a lot of people where it changed hands as it moved down through the different times. The last piece of property was actually bought when the town paid $70,000 in 1999 for seven acres. And if you look at some of this, and I'll tell you later, some of they paid $5 for the property. I tried to take pictures of the headstones of the people who were involved in the original sale of the deeds. It's kind of, it's nice to be able to connect a person to that particular time. There's no headstones for Mrs. Foy, Margaret Long, or Robert Fry, or William Fry, and I don't believe they're buried there. The picture on the first one on the left is of Mil uh, Moses Kilgore. He was born in 1871, 
17, and he died in 1890. He was one of those that sold property. Harbors was another person who had George Harbors. He was born in 1847 until 1899 when he died. On the left is the Brand Stone, and it was William Brand who, and August Brand who sold property to the town also. And also there is a headstone of Roger Etoff, although Etoff is not on there because the central stone had Etoff on it. And he was one of them that sold the lots. Otto Pyle was the next one to sell a lot. That was my grandfather. And on the left was the farmland that had been sold to him from his dad, Walter Pyle. And they were the ones that lived in the corner and had the, the uh, this is a letter, not a letter, actually it's a copy of all of the graves from the Catholic side and the, the town side. There was a lot of discussion as to it being a Catholic cemetery and a Lutheran cemetery, but it isn't. It is the Catholic side and it is the town side. And so this is a description and a dating of all the different graves that they found out there. We're now going to go, these are copies of the deeds. Now, if you're good at this, you can understand where the township line runs here and the range 20 here, 8, and all this kind of stuff. I don't understand it. But these were the drawings of the original deed process that was done as it was sold to the town. Deeds 2 and 3, and deeds 4 and 5, and 6, and deeds 7 and 8, if I'm right, yes. So, if you really want a good description, you're not going to get it from me because I don't understand it. All right, now we're going to go to when the town started to set up the original property. I have some questions about it because this took place in 1889. And the town cemetery, according to these letters, or these minutes from a clerk, is now and has been for a number of years past neglected and under the charge of no person and the town board is authorized to said cemetery to be surveyed, divided, and platted into lots of such size and with avenues, alleys, and walks, and to fix the price to sell and convey lots designated and to set the price not to exceed $2. So these are the actual minutes, and books are back there that I had taken the copies out of it. When I was holding these books, it was amazing. This book is from 1889. Think about that. That's old. That's old. <laughs> and also, the next on uh, the second page, they went to the cemetery, they reviewed the land, purchased it from Roger Etoff, and they paid fifteen dollars for that new additional piece. On April eighteenth, the board decided to build a barbed wire fence around the cemetery because there had been so many complaints about the cows getting loose, getting in, tearing up the flowers, eating up the grass, and so that's what they decided to do. They met at the cemetery on the 22nd day of April for the purpose of letting the job to build the fence. Henry Starr bid $68.25, and a Matt Ruskar billed $23 to clean, grade, and take care of the whole addition. On June, 19, on June 6th, they went to the cemetery and they accepted the job that was done by Henry Starr and by Matt, where he had leveled, plowed, and cleaned out the brush and rubbish for $23. They staked out the graves and they began numbering them 1 to 110, beginning in the northwest corner. On June 6th, the strip of land, that would be number next one, Next one. Mm -hmm. And let's see, next one also. Okay, this is they're talking about, uh, again, about the continued about the cemetery. Okay. All right, this was um, actually the paper when they sat down and drew up the description of the cemetery. And as you can see, they have the lots that are occupied and by who bought them and whether they're vacant and whether they're paid for. I 
And as you read the names, it's amazing. Having been a part of the town board and you seeing this and seeing the cemetery, all these names, our history is just so amazing that they're history, that they've done that. Okay. Let's see, where are we at? Oh, uh, the next, and that is the third page. There's actually three pages of that. There's a, out here after the meeting, you can look at it and see how it was done. I find some of my family was in there. This is the way they drew it up. Across the top, it says a Lamont Road and a Polander Road. I have no idea. I've looked. I've tried to find information as to what that refers to, but I don't know. But this was not unlike the map I got when I got on the board. It was a piece of tag board about this big. Both sections, A and B, were drawn on there. The squares were approximately an inch square. Within that was drawn eight grave sites, and the name was written on that. And that was what we had as a town record. It wasn't pretty, believe me. So, and this was another addition that was added to it. And again, you can see where it has alley and it says piles edition, and that was added on too. Again, I'm not sure where that came from, but it's hard to find. This is a picture of three graves, and they're from the fight for children. In 1889, there was a massive diphtheria epidemic that ran through Bailey's Harbor, as well as the rest of the county. There were three children of that family. There was Minnie, Mary, Anna, Minnie, Mary, and Anna, three of your children to lose them by diphtheria, and there was a lot more of them. The town board met. They called a meeting with Dr. J.B. Rick. He was a health officer. It's hard to believe in those days they had health officers, but they did. He said that a malignant diphtheria had set in the family of John Brand. Three children are dangerously sick with said disease. Now, whereas the public health is endangered by the neighbors calling at the Brand House and the members of the family leaving the house and mingle with other citizens of the village exposing children and others to the dread disease, be it resolved that the said family of John Brand shall be quarantined in their house and a guard be stationed at the premises to prevent any person from entering or any member of the house from leaving. And said guard shall do all the shopping, carry any messages that the family need be carried, and until such time as a health officer shall deem it safe to discharge and remove the quarantine, and at the expense of a guard to be paid no more than $1.50 per day. Mr. Carrington was hired. That dollar a day was to be paid from what the town had at that time was called the poor fund. On the 28th, excuse me, on November 11th, J. J. E. Stephan, W. McCullough, August Brand, James McArdle, and Dr. Rick signed this article. And it was a notice that went out. And it said, two or more guards should be appointed to prevent persons residing in the house where diphtheria exists from associating with other persons and also to pre present, prevent them from leaving their own premises and also restrict dogs from running at large. Authorized to procure as many nurses as necessary, if possible, to do so with ordinary means. They were to post five notices in five public places. The guards would be instructed to report all violations on, above the, of the above ordinance to the health officer. Rules will be enforced until the penalty of the law until further notice. There were many deaths. Mary Brand, who was three, Paul Brand, who was seven, Louis Jorns, who was 12, and it lists James Kilgore, but he was 29. So I don't know if he just happened to die that year or if indeed he could have had diphtheria also. Lorenzo Leohart was 12, Carl Pyle was seven, Aura Luella Schreiber was a baby, and it does no time frame as far as birth and death. Victor, Victor Jacobson, and I'm not sure about that, if it's Jacobson or Jackson. He was a year old. And Emma Atoff was, we don't know this either because it's dated of 1890, but because the epidemic took place in November, it could have carried through into the next year. 
Door County has death records that say there was a Willie, Rosanna, and Michael Shea that also died in 1899. There's no cemetery records. This was in the Advocate. There's no headstones. My thought is maybe they were planted in the potter's field. They were the stepchildren of John and Ellen Brand. Ellen had had the children before she married John. Also, there was an article in the Independent on November 29th from Dr. Rick, who said, the cause is not known. Maybe somebody brought by somebody who had attended a public entertainment, which was given a few days previous to the outbreak. One of the medicines that was proven most affected had been a combination of old potash and iron, and it sometimes mixed with whiskey that it was easier to get down and to gargle with. I don't know if they've changed that, but it doesn't sound very good. In May, there was another article uh, in the Advocate of the following year, May of 1890, and it was the Advocate. And it said, in Bailey's Harbor, the community is holding a memorial to the 16 youngsters aged 1 to 13 who died of diphtheria and were deprived of a public burial. The disease has broken out in Liberty Grove, but no deaths have been reported there as of yet. So that was not a good time. This was a way that the town recorded births and deaths in their cemeteries. And I think I've got Nyla's notes, and I'm going to get mine from her. So hang on a second, Nyla. I want to change with you. Nobody said this would be easy. OK. This is a beautiful picture that Nyla took of the cemetery, the four corners. Off to the left, it goes towards the Catholic. On your right, it's coming from the highway. The upper side is from um, going west. And the one down here is going back to the shed. Isn't that a gorgeous picture? I just think she did such a great job. OK, so that's our cemetery now. This is when I started, and I decided that a piece of tag board was not quite sufficient to help me get this done. So I drew a map up of what we had, and the town ended up buying corner markers that were put in the west corner of each lot so that it would be easier to find. There was, when I took it over, there was no corner markers to find the lot or where the grave sites were. <coughs> There was no written record of individual names, birth dates, or death dates for the cemetery. Being that I had to stake it out, I was trying to figure out how would I locate a 10 by 5 foot site on a 2020 lot and allow for a 6 foot alley. Well, thank God for my father. We decided that it would be a good idea to grid the cemetery, and with the help of him and his friend Ralph Franke, and heaven only knows how many stakes and how many yards of binder twine we used. We set about to try and find and attempt to map out the lots. And it was quite a job. This is actually when it goes into when I was doing the records. It's the definitions of the term, as I was writing it up, uh, like ACR refers to the cremation section. THS is a town headstone. Uh, so on down are the different descriptions of the different abbreviations that I used as I was making the records up. Now, it's going to be hard to really w see how this works. On the board over there, I put the sections together because we couldn't get all four pieces together. This is the first part. This is at the bottom. That bottom road on the east is a road called Red Cherry Road. The center up there goes right back to the shed in the back. The lot started on the north, north corner and worked their way down. When, and you can go to the next one, Nyla. And this is a continuation of that, although I think it's not the right one. So all the lots, OK, one, two, three, go on up. One more. And this is the other ones towards the back. You'll see the number 116, 117, 118, 119, and 120. If you remember before I said about they had plotted out 1 through
through 110, and that the potter's field was to lie east of that. I don't know where that got lost or why that was done, but it ended up that they deal, did sell the lots farther up. And that little triangle across the top became our cremation section. It wasn't big enough to really put in a 5 by 10 lot. So we marked it off and put it lots that were 5 by 5, which would allow for a headstone. But certainly they didn't need that. Because the old cemetery was so old, we didn't feel that it was necessary to put the corner sections in it. The, ac the records were not accurate, and we decided that it, wasn't, it really wasn't worth it because most of the lots were already taken. In many cases, the headstones that people could not afford to buy were the wooden crosses that had eventually disappeared. So we did our best. One day while walking out there on that particular section, I was walking across the grave, and I fell up to my knees in the grave, which was kind of startling, but it really didn't scare me. But here I am standing knee-deep in a grave. So I went back to my dad, and I said, you won't believe what happened. And he said, oh, yeah, I know that. I remember when I dug that grave, there was no vault. I was there at the right time with the right rate, and it collapsed. So he went out and filled it up like he normally would have. He was always so good about that. He would go back, and two or three weeks after he had dug the grave, he made sure to fill it up because the graves, the ground would settle, and he would have to fill in around it because there was nothing worse than a casket that was sticking out of the ground. It was really, really, really hard. So the potter's field really never came up, and I don't know why. I've tried to find more about that, but I simply cannot. This is a picture of the reference file. When I set up the file of the names, birth dates, whether they're year born, etc. As I went through the cemetery, I found some lot of interesting things. And I wanted to have a record of what I found. Um, different uh, records as far as one, in most cases, on a lot, there was five, four bodies across. But because heads to, uh, caskets were so small, sometimes there was five in a row. So I had to note that, so I put that in there. Um, headstones were unusual, so I would put alongside of their name an asterisk, this is section A, A4, or A5, or A6, A7, um, so that when you saw that little asterisk by that person's name, you could go back to this reference and see what I was telling you about. That's another part of the cemetery, that from the back. No, I'm sorry. This is now section B. All right. Now we're getting into the newer section. This is, that was fairly accurate, even though it was on a piece of tag board. It was fairly accurate. So having done the section A, we gridded out section B. And we put the markers in the corners as we finished. There are six, the alleys that run north and south, and that's the way they do, are six feet wide. They were done that, done that way because in those days it was all hand digging, and they did not want anyone to stand on a grave to dig somebody else's grave. And it's amazing the respect that was shown at that time. Part of my job of, in being in town, of being in charge of the cemetery, was to stake out the grave sites all year round. So the stakes were nice to find and nice to know were there. I would take a piece of a rod and drive it by each stake. When there is three feet of snow on the ground and the wind is blowing and it's cold, it's not easy to even find the metal stake, but at least it gave you some guide to go by. And I remember my dad saying so often when I would be out staking out the gravesite, he'd say, Susie, square up those corners. It's got to be done right. And I remember when I did the graves for our family, thinking, yes, Dad, I'm squaring up the corners. <laughs> One time he was asked about, a lady said to him, well, why aren't there more trees in the cemetery? And he looked at her and he said, have you ever tried to dig a big hole around the roots of a big maple tree? It just doesn't work. A tree is small when you plant it, but it doesn't stay that way. Another time when I was out there showing a grave to a man and his wife, and they were looking at different sites, and he would go and lay down, and he'd put his arms out, and he'd go, no, it doesn't feel right. <laughs> and he'd get up, and he'd go up where he'd 
no, it doesn't feel right. And his wife was so embarrassed. I said, that's OK, that's OK. The fourth one, he went, yeah, this is what I want. This feels good. So it was kind of fun. <laughs> it, was, it was interesting. So we marked out everything that we did, could possibly do, and we did that. Another time when I was out there, um, a gentleman came and said he was looking for his mother. He didn't know where she was buried. Her name was Emma Hayford. And I had no record of an Emma Hayford being buried. And I looked and I looked and I said, no, I can't, I have no idea. And he said, I know we buried mom out here, but we don't know where we buried her. So I asked my dad, I said, Dad, did you ever, do you know where Emma Hayford was buried? Oh, he said, sure, come on, we'll go out there. So he got his crowbar and his big stake and we went out there, drove it in the ground and you could hear it hitting something. Turns out that Emma Hayford was a daughter of Otto Oldenburg, that was her father. She was buried on his plot. So it's the way it is. All right, where are we now? That is a reference uh, of the town, of the, that's the reference sheet for the uh, section B, doing just like I did for the uh, section A, where you can check to see who that is, Oldenburg, and that's the story B. B4 is Otto Oldenburg, lot 115, or 15, and that tells the story. So that story doesn't get lost because nobody else, and I'm getting old, so it's not going to be long. Okay, section C. That was the final one that was bought from Wally Pyle. Uh, at the time, we staked it out, and we did make a map, but we had so many that were available that we did not put corners in, and since then, the town has had it. Uh, surveyed and they've set it up and they've run the lots in a different direction. Their lots go face north to south where all the other ones face east to west. So let's see where we're at. Okay, the name's there. When I had to find some kind of a way of putting in who was buried there, when they were buried, and where they were. So I devised a very, very simplistic little form where the name was at the top and the address, the section, the lot number, and the grave site. And then they were numbered, so in, in, for each grave site, the birth date, the death date, and on the map down below was an asterisk which said which one they were in. It made it a lot easier. And just for the heck of it, I threw this in. This is a burial certificate for a dog. Just thought I'd put that in there. You, when you had a dog, you had to get an affidavit of death or disposal of a dog. Can you imagine? I always thought they just took them out in the back 40 and buried them, but apparently not. All right. OK, this is what I ended up doing. When I, be, when I was done, I began the job of creating a record of every name and death date on the computer. I don't know what I was thinking as I didn't have a computer and I sure as heck didn't know how to use one. But I bought one and I began a basic form for the information and it took me forever to set it up. And finally I began to enter the information, name after name, date, birth date, etc. And I was tired at the end of the day. However, I did not know you needed to push the save button. <laughs> And that was the day I lost everything I had put in. And if I wasn't like a dog on a bone, I would have said, forget it. But you know, there's a saying, you never make a mistake. It's a learning experience. <laughs> I learned. I not only al uh, alphabetized the list, but then I cross-referenced by lot. Because I'd have people call and say, do you know who's in lot 25? Well, if I wanted to go alphabetize, I'd have to go all the way down finding everybody in lot 25. This way, I could just go to lot 25, and I could tell you who was buried in it. Or if you gave me a name, I could do it by the last name. And that worked out really quite well. I'm sure nowadays there's a lot better ways to doing it, but that was as basic as it could get, and that was the best I could do. But it did allow me to see how many grave sites were used and which ones. This is the entrance to our cemetery as you're going due east off of double E. At the time those pillars were put in, there was actually four. There was two on each side. There was a fence between, and there were gates that allowed people to enter 
because at that time the fence was it was fenced in. And it was a beautiful, beautiful work. And it was done by Olin Hansen. He was um, let's see where am I? Okay. Olin Hansen was from Sweden, and he was a mason. He built the uh, pillars. His, his wife actually belonged to the Women's Club, and in 1913, the Women's Club took the responsibility for the cemetery upkeep. And for those of us who lived in Bailey's Harbor, he was the father of Evan Hansen, who lived in the house on Dox Hill. One of the other things I was going to mention I forgot to was that... Um, I think I haven't gotten something more over here. 47. Um, there was always comments as to, somebody said, why are we facing east and west? Why do most cemeteries face east and west? So I looked it up. According to Google, earlier settlers had feet painted, pointed towards the west and the head towards the east. I think it's Bible, ready to rise up and face the new day when the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised. It's not a given. A lot of cemeteries don't have that, but a lot of them do. And in the year 2000, many of the headstones had to be redone because the first two letters were put on when they put the headstone out, the birth date and the death date. They used the first two, letter, two numbers, and it was 1900. I guess nobody ever thought, we're going to live beyond 1900. So a number of stones had to be changed at that time. These are kids at the cemetery. One of them is Lynn's mom, Adeline. And that's Lynn on the bottom one on the left. That's my sister Diane in the middle. And that's Lynn's brother, Lee. We thought nothing of going out there on our own, just playing around. And you can see the shed at the back. Cemeteries were a great place to be. There was no fear of a cemetery. It was a place where grandma was, where grandpa was, where auntie so-and-so. There wasn't any disconnect. We just went out there and celebrated, playing around in the cemetery. These are two pictures of a, an amazing bower of flowers. It's taken on the Catholic cemetery. A um, young man standing there is Kenny Pyle, who is the son of Walter Pyle. But I was just so fascinated by the amount of flowers and how huge it was. In those days, that, that was a lot of money for those kind of flowers. Lilies were the, one of the best ones that they ever used. On the left-hand side, that large building, it was the brand store. That's where the cornerstone is now. They sold caskets from the back of their back room. And my mom always used to say, we remember sneaking around, peeking in to see the caskets. It was just oh, so scary. Don't you wonder what that car kind of car that is? Okay, if you have a place to sell caskets, you've got to have caskets. Lynn found this in her closet or somewhere. She has a closet that is unbelievable, isn't she? <laughs> and it is called a couch casket. It literally was hinged all along the front and dropped down so it was made to look like a casket. And the I took it up to Greg Casper's and I was asking about it. And he said, yeah, they were common. In fact, if you really want one like that, you can get one made like that. So I said to him, as long as I'm here, I've often wondered, in those days, there wasn't embalming. How did you keep a body? It placed, they placed a perforated wooden platform under the body with ice to keep it cool. Three days was a maximum, and it depended on the weather and the size of the person. Some of the homemade caskets were made just to fit the people. People made their own caskets. They didn't have money. They didn't have places to go to do that. And sometimes, when they did buy a casket, it was too big to get through the door, because now we have handicapped doors. In those days, they were small doors. Greg said there were times when his dad had to remove the window in order to bring the casket in because it was so small. In the early days, most all, all of the caskets were wood and they were cloth covered. Metal came along later. But it wasn't until really after the war when, because of the war, all the metal, cement was used for the vaults, that 
they began to be popular to have the cement caskets. And vaults were originally wood. The wood caskets, you all have heard the term rough box? Anybody know where that came from? When a casket was shipped, it was shipped in a wooden box to Caspersons. They would remove the casket. They would take the rough box out. It was placed in the grave. And when they were done with the burial, the body was put back in the box, hence rough box. And Greg said as a child, he remembers crawling down in there and tightening the thumb screws to make it. So that was really the first vault. But in the 1950s, vaults were, became more popular. It was after the war, and then they could get cement. Uh, vaults were not always needed or always have to have. Each town has its own ordinance as to whether you need to have a vault. Bailey's Harbor does have one, but a lot of places don't. Another question, do you have to be embalmed? No, you don't have to be embalmed. It has come full circle from not being embalmed to being involved and not being involved. Now there are a lot of memorial service being held, and because there are going to be immediate burials, they are taken to the cemetery, and they are buried, and they aren't involved. And frankly, there is a cost factor in doing that. Can you take a casket across a state line? Mm -hmm. Yes, you can. But in California, Kansas, Minnesota, and New Jersey, you can't. In, our, in um, Alaska, in Alabama, it's a constant rule. Each state has its own rule. If you're going to move a casket in a public conveyance, airplane, or anything of that sort. Back in the days when our families, can you just back it up? This actually is my grandmother in the bottom, and I believe it's an aunt that was up on top. So many of the people were laid out at home. We kept grandma at home, we kept grandpa at home. They were laid out by the family, and that's where they stayed until they went to church the next day. It wasn't uncommon to walk by eating a piece of candy and grandma was laying in the casket, or you'd run past it. But that was what it was. It was so normal and so natural to have that body, because that's grandma. That's grandma. This is the funeral cortege of Grover Williams, 1884 to 1901. That is pretty darn awesome, isn't it? Look at those carriers, the hearse. There was an article in the paper, and it says, a team of horses of Mr. and Mrs. Andrew Bryan fright were frightened, and they ran tipping over and throwing them out of their carriage. They weren't hurt. The team capsized two other rigs that day, throwing them out, and a Mr. Hogan was seriously hurt. That's his headstone. I'm trying to, um, when we have stories, have a headstone that goes with the story. Now, I know a lot of people remember this one. This was Emery Oldenburg, formerly known as Dynamite. He was a horseman. He traveled all over having, getting horses. He raised horses. When he died, it was most fitting that he be drawn by a horse carriage. And I believe it was Berlin Keaton who hired the man to bring up, and probably he still has those uh, carriages? Yeah. And he still does that. And this is at our cemetery. And he was brought there, as they did many, many years ago. And when you think back, how did they get bodies to, the, to their graves? I'm sure they were probably sometimes just put on the back of a wagon when there wasn't a carriage around to do that. These were some that Niall had. The one, this one on the bottom is at the museum in Sturgeon Bay, and that's a picture of another one. Aren't they beautiful? The workmanship in that is just absolutely amazing. And this, of course, is Clyde and Myla Casperson, although the sign says undertaker and funeral director also a licensed embalmer. This is interesting because although you could have a funeral home, you didn't have to have an embalmer. If you wanted an embalmer, you had to hire one, and they had to have a license. That has, of course, since changed, and that's required. That sign says Edwin, but it is actually, and that was the funeral director. He um, started it in 1920. And Myla and Casperson are standing there with, uh, Clyde are standing with great pride of their new ambulance. 
it's funny when I talk to my kids about uh, paramedics and, and we have all these ambulances pick us up in accidents. We didn't have those when I was growing up. My, uh, one of the guys we graduated from high school was in a very, very serious accident. He died. The only thing they had to take him to the hospital was Clyde and the hearse. And Clyde did that for many, many people. And they went, no first aid, no paramedics, nobody. It was a friend went with Clyde and they went to the hospital. You wonder how many people might have been able to be survived had they had that. And this is the shed. It's at the back. Originally, the shed was up in front. I've tried to figure out where it would have been near the pillars or whereabouts on the cemetery up front it would have been, but going through the records, there was nothing that would indicate just where it is. And it was moved in 1925 to the back. Ah, the town board was meeting on June 26th. The meeting was being held. Someone came to the meeting and they were notified that a corpse was found in the tool shed at the cemetery. The board went there. They found Otto Bitson of Kiwani had committed suicide by firearms. They are really descriptive. Placing himself in a wheelbarrow and placing the revolver, which was found there, on the right side of his head, the bullet passing from the right ear to the left eye. The chairman ordered the guard to be posted until the body was taken away. Very descriptive. And there was a marvelous article in the paper about how he was going to be married to Marion Hickey, and um, the day that he committed suicide was the day of their wedding. Apparently, he had had problems before that, and was um, it was difficult for him, and he tried to commit suicide before that. But one of the things they said was, um, death out with Cupid was one of the headlines, which was kind of interesting. This was another headstone that I found out there that I found very interesting. It said, Augusta Ray shot in Lincoln Park. That was on her headstone. This is an article that was found, and it talks about on a Thursday night on November 8th, this man was walking east about 100 yards from Clark Street when he saw a man and a woman walking north. They were talking in loud tones, and once the woman said, oh, Carl, don't do that. A few moments later, she screamed twice, and then I heard a report and saw a flash. The woman fell, rolled over, screamed twice, and about second, 10 seconds later, I remember there was another report, and the man fell. Both lay still as I ran up to where they lay, and when I got there, a policeman also arrived, along with a number of other people. In the crowd was a man who said he knew the murder, and he used to work with them, and the man must be crazy. She had rejected him, and this was her boyfriend that she had turned down and he shot her and then shot himself. This is a picture of him, and that's a picture of her headstone where it says, shot in Lincoln Park. And again, that was what I used in the reference, that little asterisk that you could go to see and read that story. These are pictures of, I tried to go through the cemetery and find different kinds of headstones that were there that were interesting that um, there's so many different kinds and they've changed over the years as to the way they look and what they use. And I'm going to go here. There are so many different kinds of headstones. Granite, originally, Greg said, came from New England. And now a lot of granite comes out of China, the reason being that they take the uncut granite and they use it as a ballast when they come back with an empty ship. Wausau used to have a a milling area where you could buy stone from, but it no longer does. The ones that are kind of white and ugly looking are actually marble, and in those days it came from Vermont. It was very soft, and it was almost could be cut with a saw. Uh, they are also local limestone that's being used now, and what we call hard's heads, which is, I think, a form of granite. They sandblast the letters, but now they're using laser to do amazing, amazing things. The baby's shoes are Leora Mildred, daughter of H or J W Moore. She was just small; uh, she was just a year old, and it was of marble. The sign on the top or top one says "Great Grandma," and it's amazing because they would put a central stone, and around the stone they would have mother, father, sister, brother, 
grandma, great grandma. No names. In this case, it comes from the Arms, Arns family. But there's no name, so we don't know who mother was, we don't know who grandma was. It's just that way. And at the bottom was, I knew this was my great uncle, it was buried there, but there was never a headstone. So I went to Greg and had one of the markers that they give you when someone has died. He made it, I took up, went home, made some cement for him, and poured a piece of cement and put that out there so he had something as a marker. All right, we have the oldest and the youngest. The large stone is of Grandma Hummel. She was born in 1873. She died in, 18, or in 1982. She was 109 years old. Can you imagine? The youngest was Lizzie Williams. She was 20 months and 21 days. This is um, a one made like I just reported to you before. It's of Ernst Anklum. A member of the family had died, and they had the ankle put on a different lot. And I said to my dad, well, why didn't they use that plot? There's an empty lot there. He said, no, 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 there's not. And I said, well, yeah, there's no record that is, there's anybody there. He said, well, let me tell you. It was in February when he died, and it was cold. We used a pickaxe, sledgehammer, wedges, metal bars, shovels, and most important, a strong back. It took four men two and a half days to get through three and a half feet of frost. He said, I remember that one and I know he's there. <laughs> These were pictures of just some different headstones that I thought were so interesting. The one on the left is Robinson and I, there's no records of anything more than that. On the left is an urn and that's done in marble and it's so difficult that has deteriorated so much it's, I could not figure out the name on it and it's a little urn I don't know, but it's also the marble, and it's full of lichens, which is that kind of grayish green stuff on. And when I first saw that, I thought, oh my gosh, the world's coming to an end, all this stuff. Well, it turns out if you've got lichens growing, you've got a very healthy air. They don't grow in bad air, they grow in healthy air. This one is, isn't that an amazing cross? It's by, with John Beringer. He was a merchant and a farmer. And the one alongside of it is the root family. It's like a barrel, but it's kind of turned the wrong way or something, I guess. I'm not quite sure. But I thought it was a very interesting stone. The tuft one. As I said before, there would be a central stone of tuft, and then all the way around you can see the different stones. In this case, they put names on them so that you could see that, how that was. And incidentally, don't tell anybody, but that was one of our favorite stones to sit on. It was shiny, it was tall, it was absolutely great. And then there's Randy Pluffs. How many of us have gone past a cemetery and looked at it and seen all the memorabilia that's been left there? And I don't know about you, but sometimes I thought, you know, it really doesn't look too nice. It's kind of junky, because I grew up with putting flowers in the summertime and wreaths on in the wintertime. We didn't put memorabilia out there. We just didn't and thought, huh, oh, you know, really? And I must say, as I stood in front of that bench and I saw the things out there, I had an epiphany. I really did. Of all the times I've been at that cemetery and spent time out there, I looked at that and I looked at that balls that were put there and I thought, you know what? Those are love. That is love. They've, those are memorabilia, those are moments of love. That family expresses that every time they go out there. So whenever I go past a cemetery and I see a bottle of beer or I see who knows what, a golf club or a balloon, a whirly vehicle, it won't be junk to me anymore. It will, each individual item will be a piece of love that somebody is sharing for the person that they lost. And you know what? I thought how great that is because in the time my growing up, that was a good place to go. We went where grandma and grandpa were, because that's what you did. And it was family. And then there came a time where you buried people, and you, that was it. And you walked away, and you moved on. And it's come full circle. And that headstone, that bench, tells you it's come full circle. They're not afraid of a cemetery. They're not scared. 
they go out there and they sit by their dad and they talk to him and they love him and they cry for him like we all do for people that we love. So next time you go past a cemetery, just, just look. These are natural stones. The top two are just stones that were found out in the fields. The land, one on the left is my sister's. We had a uh, brass plaque put on that. And the other one is the Vistis. It has the name done, and then it has the, the um, stainless steel below. And the one below that is, that is my great, great aunt. Lynn, what is it? Great, great grandmother. Great, great grandmother. All right. It was my grandmother's grandmother. It is... Uh, porcelain, and it came from Germany. And what did we say? A hundred. A hundred years this month that that was put out there. It was sent from grandma, from Germany. It is beautiful. It's a Bible. It's amazing that it has lasted as well as it has for all these years. Interestingly, that one says "Baby Elizabeth Stearns Easter." It doesn't give an age. I'm assuming it might have been a very small baby. And it probably died maybe as a young, very young one. This other one I found interesting. Erected to George Apple by L. and J. Weiss, 1886 to 1924. I don't know why they put their names on there, but they did. Now, this is one I find interesting. The oldest grave site says Lydia Darius Griffin, 1823 to 1852. But our cemetery wasn't drawn up until 1889, so I don't quite understand that. I don't know. Phoebe Erickson, I don't know if anybody have ever read children's books. She is from North Bay originally. She moved out east. She did a great many illustrations for a lot of the golden books that we see, Black Penny being one of them. There's a number of them that are in the library if you ever want to go and look at them. I think the first picture that was ever put on a cemetery was this, a cemetery stone was this one. And I don't know about you, but I look at that and it seems to me there's a bullet hole that was shot at the picture. I hope not, but it kind of looks like that. But that was one of the old ones. Beautiful cemetery. Griffith, he says on there, tally ho. On the left hand and below that is the Faust one, that's on the Catholic one. But that's all lasered in. The picture is actually lasered into the stone. It is beautiful. You have to go out there. And the one that says Gordon actually came from the beach from the Gordon Lodge when Curly and Phil died. And they took it, had it cut in half, and put it as their headstone. A lot of lifting on that one. And this is a pump that's out there. And it works. It's still where you got a pump, boy. You've got to make that thing be before it finally comes up. And it says that the, it was put, the town records say that in 1927, the town was, it was put in, it was put in in 1927. And the, the benches are placed here as well as through the town, giving in loving memory of certain, of whoever you would like to do. In this case, it's Louis Oldenburg, who was our town chairman for many, many years. And he's also related. Isn't that something? Everybody around here, we're all related. And this is the bell. I'll tell you a little story of it. Uh, when my husband died, my daughter told my grandchildren that Papa had died. And he was an angel. They were five and six. And they argued with her, no, Mom. No, he can't be an angel. And she said, why? And they said, because we didn't hear a bell ring. We all know the story of a wonderful life. You are an angel when a bell rings. So my daughter got the bell out and she rang it. And so we had the bell mounted, put at the cemetery. The day of the cemetery, we took it with us out there because we all know that when taps are played, you don't have to know who's being buried, but you hear taps and it goes right to your heart. So after they played taps at the funeral, we rang the bell. Bob the vault man, of course I knew Bob, like a personal friend having been to the cemetery every time he came. And he said to me, I'll ring that damn bell. I'll ring the hell out of it, which he did. And it was a beautiful March day, and the, it, the sound was absolutely beautiful. And so we had the bell mounted and shared with, with everybody at the cemetery. There's so many people have said to me that they've gone out there and they've rang the bell. They don't have anybody buried there, but it just makes them feel good. They sit there, they look, and they ring the bell. 
one family member said to me, we go ring the bell because we know our sister's dying and it makes us feel good to ring the bell. And I thought, wow, that's awesome. The sound of a bell is rung to welcome a birth and it's there to toll a death. It can be a sad sound and it can be a joyous sound. That's like a cemetery. It can be a sad place. It can be a joyous place. It's not a place to hide. It's not a place to fear, but rather a place where you can go and mourn the loss of your loved one. But you can also celebrate and rejoice in that life that you shared with them. That's the cemetery. And this is the sunset. And in ending this program, I truly invite you to visit our cemetery and ring the bell for someone you love. If you come in the morning, that sun rises slowly through the trees. And in the evening, sit and enjoy the sunset and smile at its beauty and remember the ones you loved with joy in your heart. And thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Or can you give me any information? <laughs> it goes both ways. Yes. All right, certainly. If someone is interested in finding the location of a certain grave for a decedent, would they contact someone here at the town hall, or would they contact you? Well, I, the records that I did, I made a copy of, and there is actually a copy of that in the cemetery. So if it's an old name you're looking for, yes, you can go into the, into the um, library, and they have a book, and you can look like I've got there. Barbara Anschutz is on the board, and she's in charge of the cemetery, so you would call the town board. Um, but if you want just general information, kind of what I gave you tonight, mm -hmm. it would be in a book similar to the one that I have. All right. Thank you. But we're, I'm always looking for any stories about the cemetery, any, anything like that at all, anything I, I, heck, I'm sad to say, I'm 73, and I think I'm the oldest one around who has as much information about the cemetery as I do, and that is because my dad did great for all those years, and I was playing out there all the time. But, um, yes? The question was, did he do graves for the town and the, the Catholic cemetery? Sometimes yes and sometimes no. Originally, um, they had their own people who would dig their own graves. But at, towards the end, he did do that. And he did it for all of the other towns up here in the northern end. I think we, he went far south as Jacksonport, Lauren, is that right? Dad went far as uh, Jacksonport to dig graves. I don't think he went west Jacksonport. He really went far. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. Are there any cobblestone tombstones in the cemetery as there are, for example, in Egg Harbor? Now, when you say cobblestone, I'm not sure I know what you mean. A combination where they have a form and then they cover them with cobblestones? Well, I think that's the way most of them were probably done in, uh, in the Egg Harbor Cemetery. But they're primarily well, They're round small. or as nearly round <laughs> as they could get, and most of them were water-washed cobbles, I think. There is not on the town cemetery, but I can't tell you there, there is not. I don't recall ever seeing one on the Catholic side either. I don't Thank know. You. If, you, if you try to find out where the Catholic side ends and the town ends, if you stand on the west side and look back to the flagpole, that kind of is where the dividing line and the town would be on the left, and the Catholic would be right. There's some beautiful grottoes out there that were built on the Catholic cemetery. They're just gorgeous. Oh, come on. Somebody's got to have some questions. Give me some information. Yes. Um, so, the so the cemetery that it started in 1889, but were they burying people there before that? Well, according to the headstones, I think maybe they... In fact, I think um, looking through some of the records, and they're really hard. If you look at some of these books back here, these books are from 1889. They're amazing. Um, some of the records were kept and some of them weren't. 
So they had to be because there's gravestones that say they were buried there before 1889. And is there any other area around the town that they that they had as burial? Was that the only one that was ever found? Unless somebody would have a family plot on their <coughs> property, but not to my knowledge. No. Yes. Zion uh, Methodist Church has a cemetery that's been there for a long time. Out on F? Yes. Yes. My grandparents are buried out there. No. That's a little cemetery, yeah. That's shifted back and forth from the ownership by the Gibraltar area, and then it was put over to the town of Bailey's Harbor, and then back out to the church now has the jurisdiction. Okay, I did not know that. Yeah. Thank you. Susie, could some of those uh, sites that you that were very early that you were puzzled about be disinterred from some other location? And that could explain I, the dates. Maybe they were disinterred when that cemetery was actually open, but they were buried earlier someplace else. I don't know. I don't know because there's, you know, people were here in 19 or 1862. That it was settled in 1862. Yeah, but I, it was became a town according to this in 1861. Um, I don't know if there was property there that they buried them from. It's. It's a conundrum. I, don't, I, I can't find a record. There's a lot of books that don't really clear it up. Jumbo, did you have something? Yeah, there's some grave sites that were out by Boo's Point also. So okay. family was buried out there. Would that have been right family Right down the road from the uh, boat landing. Would that have been family members then? Yep, they were okay. members of the Boo's family. And that wasn't unusual where people had farms and they would plot off a small corner for their family. So that's not unusual. I was not aware of that. bury somebody in your backyard? Not nowadays. You can't do that in Billy's I don't think so. Well, I, I mean, I just make a suggestion to anybody. That. A lost. lot of people say, I want to be cremated and my ashes thrown. And hey, that's awesome. I think you need to do what you need to do. But as you've seen with this program tonight, this is history. This is history. And if you don't have your name down in something solid, nobody's going to remember, honestly. How, how many people are doing genealogy studies? And where do they go for information? The cemetery. So if you want cremation, God love you, do it. But buy a small plot, a small inexpensive stone, and put it out there so that generations to come will say, by God, she lived down there and she died down there. It's important. It is history. And you don't know that until you walk around there. Take an afternoon. Take a sandwich. Take a Coke. Go out there. Sit down, enjoy the sunsets, enjoy the morning, and just walk and enjoy. It is amazing, absolutely amazing. You'll love it. Anything else? Yes? Are there any requirements on the monuments that you put, the, the markers that you put on the grave? She wants to know if there's a requirement to how, how big a monument you can put on. Well, I'm. I must say my Aunt Frida wanted a mausoleum, and she wanted it in glass so she could be seen into a perpetuity. Didn't work out. The lot is five, it's five by ten. You can't go any wider than five. And when I went out to stake, I also staked out the headstones. And it was always an interesting process because we had one man in particular who felt he could go out there and put a headstone anywhere he wanted any time. And it got to be such a nuisance. And when my father would dig graves, he'd come up there and he'd say, now, Roly, you tell them that I sell headstones. And my dad said, we haven't even buried the people yet. I'm not going to tell them that. So I sent a letter through the town board to all of the local monument companies saying that you must give me 24 to 48 hours notice before you could put the headstone in. And I would mark it up. Well, this man didn't think it was necessary. He knocked on my door at 7 o'clock in the morning to tell me he had just set a headstone. I was ready to set his headstone. <laughs> well, he was the older partner. His son had the business now. So I called his son, and I said, you know what? Either you control your father, or you're not going to be allowed to put headstones on our cemetery. We're trying to keep a record of where they go and how they go for digging processes for the next person that's being buried. 
Well, he says, you know how old people are. I said, that's not my problem. And from that point on, I got a phone call every time it was time to put a headstone down. But it's just common courtesy, and I'm sure they still continue to do that. Anything else? Yes. Well, she asked about rubbings on the headstones. I have had to do that to get some of them off, and some of the ones that are done in marble are to the point where it's almost impossible. It's almost impossible because they've deteriorated. They're 100 years old, you know. So, yeah, it's a nice thing. And if you're going to clean a headstone, I, my husband's is, it's just an old hard head. I use uh, muriatic acid. Takes it, cleans it up just as nice as it can be, and a, and a nice stiff brush. Anything else? Do you have to dilute that? Yes, with water, and then you rinse the water off. Yes, muriatic acid. Well, thank you for coming, and maybe I'll see you at the cemetery someday. <laughs> Standing up.